Okay. Uh, hi, folks. It is currently three o'clock, but uh, we have a tradition here of waiting a couple minutes for people to be fashionably late uh, while logging in. So I'm going to wait another minute or two for people to continue piling into this chat. Uh, we'll get started in a minute or two, okay? <clears throat> We have a question in the chat asking if we're aware that JSC had a power outage. And yes, I did inform Aria of that. Uh, if folks uh, are interested afterwards, or you hear anybody who would like to check in on this, we are recording this talk and this will be posted uh, with Aria's permission on the LPI website uh, at some point after this is over. Uh, so if we have lost some of the Johnson Space Center folks, we are aware of that, and uh, we hope they will be able to jump in and catch the video version later. Oh, and for those of you who don't know, apparently, just, uh, apparently Johnson Space Center has a power outage today. So if you're not in the Houston area, uh, I guess that was our entertainment of the day is, oh, hey. You can't go to JSC today, they're off. <laughs> All right, the participants seem to have stabilized somewhat. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Ari, are you ready? I am. All right. All right. Then a brief introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Lunar and Planetary Institute's uh, LPI's seminar series. Uh, to, uh, I'm Brian Balta, and I'm filling in for Sam today, who was unavailable and who is typically running these this uh, this term. Uh, today, our, we are lucky to have Aria Udry here to give us a presentation. Aria is currently an associate professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, she did her graduate degree uh, working with Hat McSween and uh, at the University of Tennessee uh, and switched from there to UNLV where she has been ever since finishing her PhD. Uh, she's gonna be talk she is a expert in Martian meteorites and also is on the Perseverance Rover team as a participating scientist. She'll be talking to us today about some Martian samples. And I think I get to brag that apparently as of just about two weeks ago, I think she is now a US citizen. So if anyone wants to congratulate her on that, it is apparently new. So uh, with that, take it away, Aria. Hmm. Oh, Thank and you if you have questions, way. folks, feel free to post questions in the chat. And otherwise we will be adding uh, in, we will have a question period at the end. Thanks, Brian. Thank you all for coming today. I just need to tell you, I have a quite a, a bad sinus infection, so my voice sounds weird, and hopefully I won't lose it this next hour. <clears throat> I'll do my best. So hopefully you can all understand me, but I have tissue and water right next to me. So today we're going to talk about my favorite samples in the solar system, Martian samples, and how meteorites and written samples were really will and are helping us uh, understanding the evolution of the Martian interior. So first, um, <clears throat> I need to acknowledge all of my current and past graduate and undergraduate student whose research I'm actually presenting today. It's gonna be a bit of a, a broader talk on Martian meteorites in the Mars 2020 mission, but it's important to, to mention them all. And also I want to mention and thank all of my main collaborators. It's actually even more than here, but I've been working the most uh, with, with all those folks. So today we first gonna talk about Martian meteorites and the diversity and what that, does that mean about Martian meteorites. We'll talk about how using those rocks, we can better understand their emplacement in the Martian interior and surface. And also, why do we need return samples? And when I talk about return samples, I have to talk about the Mars 2020 mission and the Perseverance rover. 
And we're really going to focus on igneous rocks because I am myself an igneous petrologist and we'll focus on not igneous rocks, but the igneous uh, formation called the mass and theta formation, especially looking at uh, supercam analysis. So first, I'm sure I don't have to convince this crowd that meteorites are really important to study, but <clears throat> there's actually many processes that a meteorite can help us um, to understand um, constrain um, many processes that they can help us constrain. So including emplacement formation of magmatic rocks, as well as volcanic processes, diversity of sources. And when I talk about sources, I'm talking about geochemical reservoir. Um, really the ge geochemical pockets that we find within the Martian mantle or the Martian crust. We can also better understand volatile processes, alteration processes that, I mean, I touch all the other processes except those ones. They scare me a little bit, to be honest. <laughs> Impact processes and finally Martian meteorites and meteorites in, in general can help us understand the timing of all those different processes. So as you might know, how we obtain meteorites, I usually obtain my meteorites either from dealers or from using the NSMET collection that is at Johnson Space Center and the Smithsonian Institute as well. But <clears throat> how do we know those Martian meteorites actually come from Mars? For those of you who don't know, it's back in the, the end of the 70s, early 80s, we analyzed those meteorites that were much younger than most chondrites, and that had mineralogy and composition that looked like they had to come from a large parent body. So we actually compared a sugar type glass inclusion composition with Martian atmosphere, which was measured in 1976 by the two Viking landers. And you can see on these figures that the noble gas composition, carbon uh, composition, as well as nitrogen composition fit completely. And that was our very first evidence that Martian meteorites actually come from Mars. And now obviously this is, you know, this is actually not that those gases are not that necessarily easy to analyze. We can just look at a uh, simple triple oxygen isotope analysis as well as, as the iron manganese ratio to determine if a meteorite is from Mars or not. So how many Martian meteorites do we have today? We actually have a total of 221 recovered Martian meteorites for actually a total of 348 single stones. So 221 are what we call pairing groups. And you can see on this graph, you have in y-axis the year that they were found and note that it's not continuous. So we starting from 1815 to 1865 and number of meteorites in y-axis. So what I want you to notice is that starting 2014 really increased the number of meteorites that have been found. So actually since 2014, we found a total of 100 142 meteorites, which is quite a lot, which is more than, you know, double the amount that we found since 1815. In those, only five of them were false, so observed fall that we saw coming uh, from, from, uh, from space. <clears throat> and actually, we had this increase in meteorites because after talking with one of my meteorite dealers, um, they, they mentioned that with the education of people looking for meteorites in especially in the North West Africa desert with you know more access to internet and understanding how to find those Martian meteorites it's just simply it's been more especially that those are those rocks are, are not that cheap and by the way all of those different colors represent different types of Martian meteorites and we'll talk about them more so just a little interlude because I'm going to talk about Martian ages. For those of you who are not Martian, you probably have never heard this term before. <clears throat> but there's really three main ages that this you know about Mars. So you have on top the Earth time scale and on the bottom the Mars time scale. So you first start I actually start from closer to the present, the Amazonian. That's between three billion years and right now. That's um, where the age of most of the Martian meteorites fit. But really, if you look at Mars as a whole, as a planet, there's not that much that happened during that time. Then we have the Hesperian between 3.6, 3.7, depending on what time scale you're looking at, to 3 billion years old. And then the Noachian, that's between 4.1 and 3.6 billion years old. And before that, we have the pre-Noachian. Not a lot of Martian study, the Noachian includes from 4.5, you know, from the beginning of, of the Martian history, geological history, to 3.6 as well. And the pre noachian noachian this is where the most has happened on Mars. We're talking about large basin impact. A lot of volcanism is when uh, Mars had, you know, a true magnetism, 
uh, was actually had a magnetic field. Uh, that's when there was a lot much more water at that time. So this is when Mars would which was much more active geologically. Not that it's not anymore, but it's way less than it used to be during the Noachian. So back to the Martian meteorites, the three main group, and you might have heard the term SNC, I'm sure everyone has here, and it stands for Shagotites, Noclites, and Shasignites, which uh, those names are based on the first, <clears throat> the first samples I would find. So Shagotite, the first one was found in Shagati in India. Noclites, the first sample was found in Nokla in Egypt in 18, 19, 11, or 12. And uh, Chassignite first was found in Chassigny in central France. That was the first Martian sample to have been recovered, and that was in 1815. So all of those rocks are between 2.4 billion years old to 150 million years old. I know that the Noclites and Chassignites, both groups are around 1.3 billion years old, all, and all of that are crystallization ages when those rocks actually formed. And then we have single meteorites. So we have the famous Allen Hills AD4001. It's also pyroxenite. And this, this rock was formed 4.1 billion years ago. So it's back to the Noachian, the pre Noachian even. And then NWA, so Northwest Africa 7034, and it's 17 paired meteorites <clears throat> have classed igneous class within the R have crystallization ages around 4.4 to 4.5 billion years old, actually older age than the Jack Hill zircons, which are the oldest minerals that we have on Earth. So all of those rocks pretty much are igneous rocks. We're talking about basalts, gabbro, peridotite as well. And then NWA 7034 is the different one. It's the more sedimentary. It's a polymic breccia, but it still has igneous class within it. So for me, who is an igneous petrologist, it is perfect. I have everything I need. So as I mentioned before, <clears throat> the Martian meteorite collection have become more and more diverse. Uh, this is uh, different images of the different groups of the, the, the Martian meteorites. So you can see, by the way, cross polarized like images, plane polarized like image in the microscope, as well as backscatter electron image that we see, you know, the SEM on the microprobe, which are the, the so <clears throat> a grayscale that's based on the atomic number. <clears throat> so when I mentioned that we have a higher diversity, that means that we have found more and more different texture within the Martian meteorites, which tells us about the emplacement of those rocks in the Martian crust and or the Martian surface as well. We have found a more diverse mineralogy. Um, we have found also more iso isotopic sources. So for example, some igneous glass in the regolith breccia show alkaline sources are really old, which is unique compared to all everything else we found um, in the Martian meteorite collection. So this is why for us, it's been wonderful since 2014, because we have been able to see that the Martian interior have more complex processes than what we previously thought. One thing we don't have from those meteorites, and we don't know where they come from. We don't know the source of, of those meteorites. So right here, you might all be familiar with this. This is a molar image <clears throat> of the Martian surface. So in blue, for example, the Ellis Basin, you have low elevation. In red and white, you have a high elevation. And also put all those, all those purple points represent uh, landing sites for landers, rovers and both actually. And you have here, this is what Jezero Crater here is. Um, and you can see right to the west of Isidus Basin. So again, we don't know where our Martian meteorites come from. We know that they come from at least 11 sources. And we know that from ejection ages that vary between 0.7 million years old to 20 million years old. So they haven't been ejected that long ago. They might come from even um, more sites. But one thing, I want you to remember is that most Martian meteorites are, you know, less than 1 billion years old. I'm talking about crystallization age. However, there's a, about or less 10% of the Martian surface that's below also uh, 11 billion years old, mostly focus on uh, the Celsius province. So there's all those volcanic uh, province right here. So this is one big problem. We don't know where they come from. So we don't have field context. So let me tell you a little bit more about those rocks. So shagotites are the most common type of Martian meteorites. They consist of 88% of the entire collection. 
in age, they vary between 150 million years to 2.4 billion years. There's only two samples out that all the rest are below 700 million years old. And they really, you know, they have a mafic composition that either basalt, gabbro, or peridotite. This is a beautiful example right here of a gabbro, North West Africa 6963, that we've studied uh, with you know, Justin Filiberto, you have in red iron, in uh, in green magnesium, and in blue calcium on this on this elemental map, and you can see that we have cumulus pyroxene here with a funky patchy pyroxene zoning. That's actually pretty common for Martian meteorites. We also have the nucleites and chestnites. Personally, my favorite. You have the, the nucleite here, Miller Range two hundred nine. 0030. It is a clinopyroxene rich cumulate, which mostly co consists of CPX as well as olivine. <clears throat> and then you have uh, here one of the Chessing Knight end of year 2737. It is uh, the Donite, so mostly consists of olivine. So those two groups, they're actually really interesting because they have geochemical and textual similarities. They have same crystallization age of 1.3 billion years old, the same ejection age of 11 million years old. There's in total 24 pairing group and 34 individual rocks in total. And by the way, actually, I did not explain, but for those who don't know, a pairing group is actually a paired meteorite is when you have the parent meteor entering, entering the atmosphere and will break down as it comes down to Earth. And so all those meteorites come from a, one same pairing group, but they also come from the same parent meteorite as it was entering the Earth's atmosphere. And then all the nucleites and chassignite, they're petrogenetically linked, as we've seen with like a bunch of <clears throat> recent studies. So what's really interesting with those rocks is that because they likely come from the same volcanic province, they all have the same ejection age. We can study them the same way we would study a rock on Earth. So for example, if you go in the field on Earth, you're not going to go take one rock and go home. You'll be a pretty lazy geologist. It's the same here. We have actually 34 different rocks that we can study that we know come from the same province. It's an actual suite of, of igneous rocks that we have that we can study all together. There's also the very famous Allen Hills 84001. It's a very old rock. It's Noachian, pre Noachian, actually 4.1 billion years old. <clears throat> it's also pyroxenite, so it's a cumulus. Um, but this is very famous because it was argued to prove life on Mars. So what was found in it was actually um, carbonate globules, iron, magnesium rich carbonates with a magnetite inclusion in it. And it was argued that those magnetite could have formed possibly from magnetobacteria, same that what we find on Earth. And later on, I don't know if, I cannot see the participant, but some of you actually might have published on that, on the fact that actually those carbonates would have simply formed from low temperature alteration and those magnetite would have formed through shock. But this actually helped, you see 1996, um, this, this discovery that happened not to be true. Uh, help really push forward the, the Martian program. And the last rock I'm going to talk about is Northwest Africa 7034 is a 17-pair sample. This one is very unique because it's a polymic regulus breccia. Polymic means it has class that all come from different parental melt or even possibly sources. And it's this is great for all of us because it's pretty much having different meteorite within one meteorite. So it's mostly igneous class, but you also have some impact melt class. And I, I hope you can, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor or not, but you can see this really spherical class right here. This is really likely an impact melt. So this rock has been fascinating for different reasons. One of them is because I mentioned before, we have some of the oldest igneous class, so 4.4, 4.5 billion years old, and show this alkaline magmatism, which is not necessarily expected that early in the geological history of Mars. And there's still so much more to have been done, which is this, this one rock. So by studying <clears throat> Martian meteorites, we can actually, even if we don't have field concepts, we can better understand the emplacement of the Martian crust as well as the Martian surface. So on this figure, there's a lot. You don't need to look at all of it in detail, but you can see kind of three different columns that represent three different groups of actually four different groups of Martian meteorites that have distinguished by the texture. So we have olivine ferric 
poikilinic and basaltic gabbroic schematites. You don't need to remember those names, but what we have found looking at composition, mineralogy, and actually azotopic analysis is that all of those groups are actually linked together, petrogetically linked. For example, the poikilinic schematites would have formed from an olivine like magma, and the basaltic and gabbroic schematites also would have formed from an olivine freak magma after fractionation of you know, main minerals such as olivine and even pyroxene, which is actually really cool because, you know, we need to understand those sugar types. This is the main group of Martian meteorite that we have. We've actually, excuse me, we actually also analyzed, you know, those nucleites and chassignites as a group because those rocks, remember, the 1.3 billion years old, they likely come from the same volcanic province. And actually, after extensive quantitative textual analysis, uh, as well as mineralogical analysis, we're able to, to define kind of different flows within this um, nucleite and chassignite magmatic body or magmatic province. It could be one single volcano, it could be actually several, um, but it used to be suggested that all of those rocks come from one single flow, and we show that it's not the case. It comes from different flows, or actually even different seals, and more and more I study those rocks, the more I see them, the more I'm convinced they are actually intrusive and not necessarily extrusive. But really, to better understand the emplacement, we need <clears throat> more 3D analysis, 3D quantitative textual analysis to better understand the, <clears throat> you know, the orientation of those grains and really what it looks like within those grains to understand, you know, if or the flow, if it was a cumulative, there was, you know, it can even help us understand like possibly this convection, the magmatic chamber. So this image, this shows, um, <clears throat> this is an XCT image, so X-ray computer tomography. This was conducted <clears throat> at University of Texas, but this is from my uh, PhD student, Sarah Ramsey's uh, PhD's um, dissertation. So what you can see here, this is the inside of an oclite. So it's pretty much like a CAT scan, except that it's with rock. So you can see here all this pyroxene in dark gray and light gray right here, you have this large olive in, and then in between you have the inticulous matrix that can be glass or plagioclase. And this really can help us understand the true shape of those pyroxene and olive in. And you can even see like what we call melt inclusion. Those are little pocket of trapped magma that we can analyze to better understand the pantal magma composition. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I can spend hours looking at those. They are very they're fascinating. It was shows, shown with uh, some very um, new studies, for example, by Scott Eckley, that we, we found some new texture that we've never seen in thin section before. Noted that those rocks have been looked at in a microscope since the you know, end of 70s, 80s. It's so brand new textures just through 3D analysis. And I really truly believe that 3D analysis is, really, is the future of, of petrology and understanding, you know, better understanding textures for understanding the emplacement of those rocks. <clears throat> One thing that my, my group has looked at as well uh, to better understand emplacement and storage time of, of those rocks is melt inclusion analysis. So like I mentioned before, and you can see two little ones here in the Chassignite NW2737 and in the Nuclite Mill Range 90030, those are uh, hosted in olivine. And you can see the little crystallized uh, pocket of trapped magma that happened really early in the crystallization. So we can look at major element, trace element within the smelt inclusion to understand maybe the source of those rocks. And actually we've done that for both nucleites and chassignites as well as shagotites. And we use trace element that we use here on earth to de determine different sources, like for example, the higher Hawaiian volcanoes. <clears throat> you can see for the shagotites, the melt inclusion composition, this is zirconium over yttrium, by the way, and this is nobium over yttrium. All those envelopes represent different sources that was um, uh, measured through bulk composition of those rocks and all the different dots represent melt inclusion analysis. You can see that they fit really nicely, relatively nicely within the bulk rock composition with the shagotites. However, for the nucleites and chassignite, it is all over the place, likely showing that we had a longer storage time for those nucleites and chassignite within the magmatic chamber, and that means that there was some sort of recalibration for those melt inclusion. So we cannot really infer that much uh, 
using trace element analysis. It's also not surprising because nuclides and chassignites might have formed through throughout a hundred million years old, a hundred million in a million years, which is a really long time if we look at if you compare it to terrestrial um, storage time as well in hotspots on Earth. Excuse me. Another study that I'm really excited about, and something that we can look at for emplacement of Martian, Martian meteorites when we don't have full context, and actually we can do the same on Earth, is looking at minor element distribution in the main phases of our rocks. And those minor elements, including phosphorus, phosphorus in olivine or chromium and pyroxene, do not diffuse with time. So if you look at, for example, iron and magnesium in olivine and pyroxene, even if they are very heterogeneous, as the pyroxene grows, over time, it will, those iron magnesium zoning will become, well, will just diffuse and become homogeneous. And we cannot really infer much with those composition. But with phosphorus and chromium, we can understand much more. So for example, this is a giant olivin right here. You can see the core that is <clears throat> low in phosphorus. And what sometimes what has been seen in previous studies is that we have a xenocrystic core. So a core that has a different pentor or even different source as the rest of, uh, of the mineral and the rock. And with chromium, we can actually are able to see if we have rapid ascent or even, even mafic, mafic recharge, within our magmatic chamber. As we can see here, we have a part of it that's a little bit more enriched in chromium, the likely means that we had a, a mafic recharge. So there's still a lot that can, that can be done even without field context by looking at melt inclusion, mineralogy, and, and distribution of, of certain elements. So I hope I convinced you that you saw we have more and more diverse lithologies in the Martian meteorite collection. We have actually an interior that's more heterogeneous than previously thought. And we have, a, have actually an emplacement of those rocks that's similar to terrestrial igneous rocks. However, we again, we have this bias sampling of the Martian crust. First, we don't have field context of those rocks and we're missing rocks that are between 4.1 and 2.4 billion years old. That's half of the Martian geological history. That's a lot. And actually, we've seen with rovers, there's still a lot happening during that time, geologically on Mars. And we're also missing lithological diversity. So, you know, I told you about all those rocks, but at the end, it's all, you know, pyroxene, olivine, plagioclase. We found those amazing potassic, uh, potassium rich rocks in Gale Crater, um, possibly felsic rocks as well in Gale Crater. And also in Gusev, Gusev Crater, we found. <clears throat> A lot of a lot of different rocks from very alkaline and even closer to to felsic, that shows that there's much, many more processes happening on on Mars that we can see in the the Martian meteorite collection, at least the current one. But we still need state of the art geochemical, petrological, and geochronological geo 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 analysis. One thing that we're also missing is a good definition of Martian crater ages. Right now, as you know, we're using the lunar calibration for Martian crater counting, which is not necessarily, you know, that accurate because it's to a different location of the, the solar system. They have undergone different impact histories. So really for that, to better <clears throat> understand the global Martian geological history, we need return samples. And when we talk about return samples, we talk about the Perseverance rover in Mars 2020. So it landed in Jezero Crater in um, <clears throat> February 18th, uh, 2021. You can see her right here, proudly uh, looking over uh, the mark of the drills. Of <clears throat> This is the sample Montagnier Montagnac that she sampled um, around Sol 100. And those are Ignis samples. So today I'm really gonna focus on the, the Ignis rocks that have been um, analyzed by the Perseverance rover. So right now it's in Jezero Crater, <clears throat> okay? And the goals of Mars 2020 was to determine if Mars ever supported life, to understand the processes and history of climate on Mars, to understand the origin and evolution of Mars as a geological system. This is what my research obviously is focusing on and then prepare for human exploration. So Mars 2020 has seven scientific instruments. 
So briefly, for example, we have RIMFAX that's looking at subsurface seismic data to better understand, you know, the different layers and the, you know, the relationship. MOXIE, that's a really cool test instrument that's looking at taking pretty much converting the CO2 from the atmosphere into oxygen and seeing how efficient it is because when human go to, humans go to Mars, we'll need oxygen to breathe and oxygen for fuel to come back to Earth. <clears throat> also, we have META, which is pretty much a weather, weather instrument with MASCAM-Z, which is, you know, the eye is kind of the rover. And also we have this <clears throat> great uh, visible near infrared spectrometer on it. There's also Pixel, a great instrument. It's pretty much we can we can have beautiful elemental maps uh, of the rocks here that are braided as well as composition of those rocks. And I myself focus uh, and work mostly with the SuperCam team. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we can do with SuperCam. So <clears throat> Perseverance rover landed here at the Octavia E. Butler landing site. I highly recommend to, to read her books. She's, she's a great scientific fiction, science fiction author. And so <clears throat> here we're focusing on the first 379th Sol. And the Sol, by the way, is a Martian day. So during that time, Perseverance roved around two main Ignis uh, units, the mass formation and the Zeta formation. Those names are uh, Navajo words. Mars, Mars means Mars, and Zeta means uh, amongst the sand dunes, Navajo. So throughout its path, it went down this direction, still in the Mars formation, hanging around around RTB Ridge, which is still part of the Mars formation, and then around Sol 201, entered the Zeta formation, which is a little bit different, and then came back out and went back on its way up now to the delta. So the, for the first 379 sols, it was in all Ignis rocks, which is, great, which is great for me, which I was really excited about. And also it, it uh, collected samples and you can see all the different sample assembly collections. So we had first actually it was Rubion, then Rochette, then Isol, Brac, and then finally Seed. And by the way, we were in, uh, the quadrant was in the <clears throat> location from like southwest of France, so it's all um, French name. And I always had a lot of fun hearing Americans pronouncing uh, French names for once. I'm not the one with the weird accent. And also one thing is that we have the content target here. If I show it with my fingers, you won't see it. And the content target are within the CETA formation, but they look a lot like the mass formation composition wise, as well as mineralogically. <clears throat> so the question that we had, I really mostly focus on, on the mass formation is, is it Ignis? So what we, and actually what the entire team, especially the MassCAMZ team was able to, to do is to distinguish mass into different members. <clears throat> so we had the upper mass member here, or the upper mass formation as well, which consists also of the Chash member and Atani member. We had the Humio member, the Rochette member, and the RTB member. So really this actually would define into three different members, the upper mass members and the lower mass members. And this is based on composition, mineralogy, as well as geomorphology. And you'll see throughout my talk, I really defined that as the upper mass member, lower mass member, as well as the Kunta member that was found in the Seta formation. I hope you can all see that this all had this pitted, um, pitted texture. So today I'm focusing on the SuperCam analysis, um, especially LIBS analysis. So SuperCam has a LIBS instrument, a Visnia instrument, as well as a microphone and a remote micro images that take those kind of images that you can see right here. So more context, but it can be pretty zoomed in. So <clears throat> the LIBS is a really cool instrument. It's pretty much can analyze rocks we believe the data between 1.5 meters to 6.5 meters. We can analyze them later, uh, further away, but <clears throat> the you know the calibration is not as good uh, as of yet. So what happens is like it's going to shoot a laser, and then this laser will transform the rock into plasma. The plasma will emit a light. 
which has a spectra, and we're going to measure the, the spectra and convert it into elemental composition using a bunch of different calibration. So it's going to shot usually 30 shots within the rock, and we, we usually remove the five first shots because it corresponds to the dust layer or maybe even coating or something like that. So at SOLS 379, we've taken a lot of different point analysis, uh, 1,057 single point analysis for a total of 114 targets in the mass formation. We also measured like regulars, but I'm not going to focus on that. So first, let's look at the texture that we see in the mass formation. There's a lot. There's a lot on this image. <clears throat> we found some coated and clotted texture that are very fine grained, some pitted texture. I don't want to see vesicular because it's not necessarily vesicular, but it's pitted and you can see different size of pits, different um, different shape as well, and then non-pitted rocks from phenetic to more aphenetic as well. So <clears throat> what I want you to take a message actually of this of this slide is that we have <clears throat> very different textures and very different grain size in those rocks, but it's still all relatively igneous, especially for some of them that look quite um, quite flowy. And for the SETA formation, we found actually a little bit more homogeneous textures, but that shows cumulative textures. So if we zoom in, I hope you can all see all those grain size right here. That really correspond to cumulative. Found some olive in, some also pyroxene, and some cleaner pyroxene. And actually, that was confirmed by pixel by the pixel instrument when we have those olive in and close in those those beautiful pyroxene. So. Again, we observe all those different textures. Could a texture possibly represent outer composition? We have this buggy pitted texture representing more effusive, possibly volcanism, so vesicles, or it's possible that it's crystal molding. So that means that the mineral just pop out of the rock from alteration, for example. And also we have some phaneritic, more coarse grain texture, possibly represent, representing intrusive. Um, magmatism or thick lava flows. We more believe that it's thick lava flows, but all of them are found throughout the entire mass formation. And there's not really a relationship between where it was found compared to the texture. Excuse me. So we have possible presence of both effusive and coarser texture rocks, and that's very common in thick lava flows. We found that on Earth, very diverse uh, textures in thick lava flows. So this is what we think we have on, on mass, several thick lava flows with diverse texture in the mass formation. And you can see some other beautiful texture. This is here. This was taken by MassCamZ. This is Tat Sada, and it has this power texture that you would find in like lava flows, basaltic lava flows in Hawaii. This is an abraded patch, so patched a rock that was abraded by <clears throat> the perseverance of Guillaume, which has this microgabaric texture, and you can see you know, where's my cursor? Here in white, we have the plagioclase, and in black, you would have um, pyroxene, and this white represent more, much more alteration, for example. And, and those rocks have similar texture to basaltic sugar types, and we've seen those before. We can look at 7320 gabbric sugar types right here. This is a backscatter literal image, or NW8159 as well. They're very similar. The main difference is that we actually don't have any vesicular texture in Martian meteorites. No, I haven't seen any of them. Maybe some of you have, but I haven't. Looking at the composition, the bulk composition of mass. <clears throat> so you have here silica versus alkaline elements. This is a typical TES diagram, magnesium over aluminum, calcium, and iron. There's a lot going on here. In orange, you have different mass composition, the upper mass, aphanitic and phaneritic, the lower mass as well, the contour member. So what you can see is first, oh, by the way, and all of the rest, this is all, all the other color, it's all meteorites, as well as some of the Gale and Gusev crater composition. So in orange, you can see here, all those mass composition that are enriched in alkali elements compared to most Martian meteorites except maybe the polymic regulus breccia. But they have lower, especially <clears throat> lower calcium than most Martian meteorites, and as well as um, lower magnesium as well. Otherwise, they're just, as you can see, <clears throat> right here and right here. But relatively same iron, some aluminum as some other Martian meteorites. If we look at the mineralogy, the mineralogical composition, so the libs, 
um, beam, by the way, I didn't tell you, but it's, it has a size between 170 microns to 370 microns, and that's based on the distance to the rock. Um, so using stoichiometry, stoichiometric data, we're able to uh, isolate some, some minerals. And by isolate, I mean just a Libs beam measured completely entirely of pyroxene. It was just one single mineral that was measured. And you can see this is the pyroxene composition of all, all the mass pyroxene that we found, which was about 20 of them. And you can see that they're relatively iron rich. They're not relatively iron rich, they're very iron rich. Um, but you can also see that the mass pyroxene of a different composition from the C-type pyroxene that you can see here highlighted in, um, in purple. We did the same for plytoclase. We found a one amino in the content member. Remember, that was the member that was in, in the C-type formation. We didn't find any olivine in our rocks in the mass formation. And that, that actually matches what the other instrument have, has found as well. If we compare them to Martian meteorite, you can actually see, and I know there's a lot on this pyroxene quadrilateral, but you can see that this pyroxene actually have a composition that's very similar to basaltic and gabaric shagotite, called Los Angeles and NWS320. And all those are very rich in iron, which makes sense. We have this really iron rich lava flows. <clears throat> and the pyroxene for Zeta are actually more similar to proteolic shagotites, as well as uh, the regulus breccia. And those proculic shagotites, it kind of looks like the texture that we've seen in pixel as well. So really we have a mineralogy that's relatively similar to what we found in Martian meteorites, nothing crazy new. We tried to understand the link between the different members in the mass formation. So for that, actually my, my um, PhD student, Amanda Osvald has looked at, has conducted fractional crystallization melts models. And you can see that those here, you have phenol diagrams of magnesium versus all the different major element oxide. You have also, again, silica versus alkali elements. And you can see all those lines represent liquid lines of descent, so evolution of the melt, if you will. And you can see that they all kind of overlap, meaning that all of those rocks are relatively, those possibly different lava flows are all related to um, each other, and it's within area of the SuperCam instrument. It doesn't fit SETA, but <clears throat> it's gonna take a little bit more time to figure out the, the link between the SETA and the mass formation, because SETA is a cumulant, and so it's difficult to enter it in those fractional, fractional precision models. Um, but there's more work that needs to be done on it. So hopefully convince you that the mass and the SETA formation are igneous. We have beautiful igneous textures. We have igneous minerals that are present, pyroxene and some small plateauclase, likely small because we only analyze one when we know we have basaltic composition. There has to be more, at least analyzed by, um, by SuperCam. I know that Pixel has, has found it. We have similar mineralogy and composition to iron-rich basaltic meteorites for the mass formation. And SETA is more homogeneous texture, much more cumulative texture, as well as mineralogy, and contains actually olivin. So for the formation of mass, <clears throat> we really truly think that we have in, in presence of thick lava flows, when you have different, um, different texture, like phaneritic, more buggy, fine grains, we have power AOA as well, on top of that SETA formation. And this possibly could be some paraclastic flows. And it was shown that as some of the studies that we have, you know, those thin beds in the RTB ridge, remember that was on, on the mass formation as well, possibly represent, representing paraclastic flows, but we'll know more once we have the samples back. We don't think they accumulate because we really didn't see this cumulative texture or um, in those different in those different members, especially with vesicles texture and everything. It we're really likely much more in volcanic setting, extrusive setting. So the mass formation is igneous and it's relatively similar to Martian meteorites, so relatively similar to iron rich meteorites like Los Angeles and the 320 but we have slightly different compositions. So they're more enriched in like our elements. Aluminum, magnesium and calcium compared to the shagotites. So those rocks are very important for sampling because we have different composition and they can also, you know, there's likely have a different ages, they're probably older than those Martian meteorites. So that really, by sampling those rocks, it can help us better understand um, the chronology of this igneous activities and understand the igneous activity itself as well. 
So for the moment, we have eight igneous rocks that have been sampled. Again, this is a Montagnier and Montagnac samples. Again, they were collected around Sol 100. <clears throat> and hopefully there will be much more once we uh, go to the crater rims, possibly some Noak and crust. I am dreaming for felsic rocks. I'm sure some of you, the audience as well. So hopefully we find that. And right now we actually have collected a total of 16 samples. So half of them are going to be more, much more sedimentary. And some of you might have heard some, some talks at LPSC. So we are saw 756. We have uh, driven 11 miles, which is quite a while. And remember, I showed you the mass in the Zeta formation. This is just here, right here. So after Sol 380, we went up the Delta. We did a lot of round trips in this area, and now we're on the way, on our way closer. To, ooh, excuse me, to the crater rim. We just collected a sample. When was that? Two or three days ago. To better understand all the, you know, more fluvial or aqueous activity that happened in this delta and sedimentary activity and potentially understand better biosignature in this in this area. So there hopefully will be 31 samples that will come back to us around uh, 2033. We have very diverse lithologies and we have igneous lithologies and igneous composition that I'm personally very excited about. Um, and rocks, hopefully, that will <clears throat> spread in ages from the Noak into the Amazonian. And really the complementary study of return samples and meteorites will help constrain the evolution from early in the Martian geological history to the present really of the Martian interior and surface. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll take any questions. All right, folks, if you want to add uh, the chat, uh, applause reaction. I am doing that as well. If anybody wants to applaud in person, they can feel free to do so. Uh, at this point, if you would like, if anyone would like to raise their hand, uh, and I will call on anybody who does, or we can add uh, questions to the chat as well. Uh, I will pause for a second and see if anybody jumps in. I am currently not seeing anybody with a hand up and nothing else in the chat. Anybody? All right, Aria, you're going to get stuck with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, don't like, I, know, I know this. I've seen know, that too I much. Know. So you mentioned, no, not, nothing horrible. Uh, you mentioned that there's no vesicular textures found in any of the Martian meteorites. And uh, I was just wondering, would that actually survive ejection if you had a vesiculated igneous rock? That's a great question. Might be the reason why we don't have any. This is also the, possibly the reason why, you know, we have only this one polymic regolith breccia. That's actually surprising we have it. I mean, it's pretty, it's quite dense, um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> um, so that, that could be one, one possibility, one why that's probably the main one that we cannot eject easily, those vesicular rocks, because I'll just break down too much. And I don't know if there's any experiments that would have. Yeah, uh, has anybody uh, done this? I, Johnson Space Center has no power today, so they can't. So uh, <laughs> other than that, and somebody has to have shocked a vesicular rock at some point, right? On one of the gun ranges. I, right. well, I, I can toss in a couple bits of information. Alan? This is Alan Treeman. <clears throat> um, the uh, uh, 79001 Shergodite had cracks in it which were compressed during, uh, during shock and incorporated some Martian atmosphere into them. So that's sort of like vesicular. It's, it's got holes in it, and that one managed to survive. Um, <clears throat> another bit of information is that the uh, you talked about melt inclusions in olivine grains. The melt inclusions in olivines in the knocklight meteorites commonly contain vesicles or void spaces, but the rocks outside the, outside the olivines don't, mm -hmm. which makes it look like what's happened there is not a, a result of shock, but rather that the the magma degassed after the olivines that trapped the melt inclusions. Yeah, exactly. 
So uh, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, I did ask if it was possible for them to elaborate. We'll see if they chime in. Uh, from Marianne Dyson. So uh, notes that they're not a geologist, uh, but says they're curious if there's any elevation effect on the samples. I asked them if there was anything specific that they were interested in and have not heard back yet. Uh, how many of the samples were, quote, washed downhill? Oh, you, are you talking about the MOS 2020 samples? I believe that's exact. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Um, well, we try, you know, <clears throat> the thing is, we need to take into account if we have float rocks or not. So in geology, you know, if you go in the field, you want to look at an outcrop and not just a rock on the ground because it could come from much further away. So, you know, analysis would try to, when we make all those, you know, inference and assumption, it's by looking at outcrop and not just a rock, a float. So what you think about wash downhill, that's it. That's, that would be a float. So it can tell us a lot. And there's still like, you know, recently some, some sample that we, we've looked at in the Delta. I'm like, hmm, this is an interesting float, but I cannot say anything about it because I have no context. But um, so yeah, we want to focus on the on rocks that are, come from outcrops. So have geological field context. I hope that answers your question. Okay, one more comment was at, or question added to the chat. Uh, Jasmine Belandres, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, good day. <laughs> Is there significance as to why the belt compositions of Maz are more, or they say more on alkalis, I imagine they're trying to say, it. why are they more alkali rich? That's a great question, actually. Well, it's, it's interesting that we don't have more alkali rich rocks in our Martian. Um, collection because a lot of what we see at Gusev Crater, so what was analyzed by Spirit, especially in Gal Crater, as some of you know very well here, that rich in potassium, that could be due, actually this enrichment in alkali elements could be due to possibly a different source, um, melting of the source at higher pressure, or also that we have just what we call evolution within the crust. So it's just, we have more, <clears throat> primitive minerals that have fractionated and we have more and more alkali elements. So slightly different magmatic, magmatic processes. Um, it's, yeah, my, what's more surprising is why we don't have it more in the Martian meteorite collection because we keep seeing it at the Martian surface. And so possibly at the Martian surface, like all those samples will be more alkali rich possibly. But yeah, this is, this is a, a question we've tried to answered with my group and 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 Valérie as well who's asking question right now. I unmute, yes. Okay. Uh, we had one thank you show up and we had an additional question from Valerie uh, saying how do you explain that the Maz uh, rocks slash pyroxene are that FE rich without being much rich in SiO2? That's a good question, Valérie. <clears throat> so a lot of those iron rich, you know, it's a good question because some of those pyroxene, especially, and if you remember the pyroxene crater are right next to the first alite and member. And that's been a big question we ask. We're wondering like, is it a problem of an error, you know, a calibration mistake or something like that, but it could correspond to symplectites. But in this case, which uh, represent more faster cooling as well, in this case, it should be more enriched in silica. So possibly could be a source, an iron-rich source that is possible. But no, I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer for you. We need the samples back. And actually truly understand those textures, because like I said, like we we were not even able to see the plagioclase in in um, with with Supercam. I know Pixel has found them, but <clears throat> with with um with um supercam we're not even able to find the plagioclase when I we know there has to be plagioclase. So that's a great question. I'm leaning towards the source, but who knows? Thank you. Okay, that's a few questions. Uh Anyone else want to add anything to the chat or raise a hand if you want to ask in person? Oh, 
Okay, there we go. Uh, from SJ Ralston, what alteration, if any, do you expect to see in return samples due to exposure to the space environment or re-entry? That's a good question. Hopefully none. <laughs> That's the whole point, I think, of those, those cash, you know, in those tubes. Um, I mean, there has to be a reaction with, you know, cosmic rays and, and you know, we'll, we'll have, you know, possibly isotopic differences and all the cosmogenic isotopes, I would imagine. But hopefully as limited as possible. And, you know, I'm not a pro in alteration. I know you are, but uh, I don't know if someone else from the mission can, can better answer than me. I, I would imagine as little as, as possible, hopefully none. Well, I think in theory, the sample return tubes are sealed well enough that they would retain whatever Martian atmosphere they had to start yeah. with. And so they wouldn't, in theory, you know, lose pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, the effects of temperature, I think, are pretty unclear. You know, what's going to happen when they cool down? Like if you got it, like amorphous magnesium sulfates or something, what are they going to do? And I don't know. Do, do you know any idea how much they expect the samples to be heated upon and en re-entry to Earth? I don't. I have no idea how much there is there. I, I expect not very much. I, no, I don't think so. And I would imagine the engineers, when they designed those those tubes, they would have thought about that. <clears throat> yeah. But I don't think. And you know, I mean, when you think about a meteorite, it was really. We don't have much. It, it melts, you know, we have the fusion crust, but that's about it. Yeah, that's right. The, the interior stays cold. Mm -hmm. the, there are reports of fresh falls that, that get ice on them by because they're so cold inside, they're condensing water out of, the, out of our atmosphere. Exactly. So probably not a lot is going to happen in transit. This is Walter. I'll, I'll add one thought, which is that Remember that the Genesis samples, which you would have really worried about degassing, um, made it through just fine. Um, yeah. You know that's the the whole point of the the um, the entry system is to shed the heat away from the spacecraft. Um, you know we brought a lot of people back same way. So I think that of course those are bigger space bigger spacecraft, but I, I think that that's the expectation that uh, that that they'll survive with with minimal thermal alteration. Thank you. That was an excellent discussion there. We have maybe one or two more minutes if anybody wants to ask something at the end here. Uh, I'll, I'll just I'll just toss in a freebie here. Uh, Aria, what kind of igneous rocks do you expect to find once we get out outside the crater or off of the sedimentary delta we're on now? I mean, you know, I'm as I mentioned, I'm fantasizing about, you know, no, I can cross that might be actually more fancy, you know, why not? We've seen, we've seen it, you know, even in, in Gal Crater, why not finding again, like potassium rich rocks or, <clears throat> or, you know, rocks, alkaline rocks and, and yeah, something a little bit more felsic. I know whether he agrees. This is all. This is what I want to found. Hopefully, you know we have enough results. I mean, more results, <laughs> more results would be great. Yeah, but <laughs> Ryan doesn't agree. But no, I, I, I would want really more like results. to results with I'm field context. Results <laughs> with field context, but I would love to see also, you know, like something with you know um, lithology, like we find in in North Africa seventy thirty four. You know, in those classed. I mean, those those are crazy. We have, you know, almost this granoblastic texture in those rocks. But, you know, I think that's that's what I would love. But um, it's really, yeah, just no, I can cross. This is rich here to know I can cross. Maybe we'll find more regulars, like something more like NV7034. I'm very excited to be in the crater rim and above and beyond. Yeah, me too. But that's, you know, Cygnus Petrodra is talking. <laughs> Enough with the sense, though. 
can, can I toss one additional idea in there, which is that you're not going to be very far from some of the spectral detections of the spectral equivalents of knock lights and chassis nights. Uh, something that you could actually bring that back and say, yep, these are the same things would be really cool. It so be on, be. be on the lookout for that, That's just in case. Sure. Yeah. And, and that would certainly be possible as some kind of ejecta. I think something that will interest a lot of people, and maybe including SJ, is that there are some class, some huge class in the mega breccia, which I guess is probably from the basin, that appear in reflectance spectra to look to look like Montmorillonite. Mm. Mm. All right, folks. Uh, yeah, if yes. people want to hang out and continue this conversation, I'm game to keep this open. But uh, it is four o'clock, so we've had a full hour. So. Uh, let's go ahead and thank our speaker one more time uh, with the uh, reaction at the very least. Uh, thank you. And thank you for having uh, me. <clears throat> so Sorry thank for the you again, words. Aria, uh, for enduring uh, and keeping hydrated during a uh, handful of thank yous in the chat as well. Uh, it has been a great pleasure and uh, have a good afternoon, those of who are taking off. And if anybody did want to continue asking anything, I'm not going to close this just yet. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll stop recording.